Hi everyone. So this is my lecture on valvular disorders and I put uh, heart sounds in conjunction with the valvular disorder lecture uh, simply because they do go hand in hand. Uh, many of the valvular disorders will produce sounds that we can auscultate on physical examination and it can be diagnostic. So it's very useful to understand how they kind of uh, go together. Okay, so before I begin talking about uh, the individual valves um, and their different uh, pathologies, I want to just sort of stress that um, you know, when we're talking about the heart, remember um, as blood flows from the right side of the heart through the lungs to the left side of the heart, it's again, it's in series, okay? So the reason I'm pointing this out is that as we have, let's say, a valvular disorder, if it's, let's say, the mitral valve, since that's what we're starting with, uh, what can happen is if, if you have malfunction there, that can translate uh, backwards as part of the series. So for instance, if there's an issue with the mitral valve, that could affect the left atrium. It could affect uh, the pulmonary circulation. And if you affect the pulmonary circulation, that can have an impact on the right side of the heart, including those valves. Okay, so the, although I will discuss them as single entities, understand that there can be combinations of these valvular disorders that may follow uh, because of a particular disorder with one particular uh, valve. Uh, another thing to point out is that uh, when we talk about the valvular disorders, we're really talking um, about stenosis, which means a narrowing of the valve, um, as well as uh, regurgitation. So those are really the two forms that it'll take. All right, regurgitation, uh, another word for that is insufficiency. And so what we have is either a stenotic valve which means that we have a very narrow opening so it's going to be hard to move blood through that narrow opening or or we have um, a regurgitation in which blood is moving uh, in the wrong direction uh, and depending on how big the the, the regurgitation is or the volume is uh, that can play a different role so we'll talk about that so I want to start, I'm just going to talk about each valve, uh, starting with the, the mitral valve. And so remember, in the mitral valve is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle. And we'll talk about mitral stenosis first. So this, of course, is going to be a, a narrow opening in the valve. Understand that this is not uh, an, an absolute. Stenosis, um, there's a gradation of stenoses, meaning, you know, it, it could be mildly stenosed or it could be very severe, okay? Now, what causes something to become stenotic? Uh, well, some of the more common etiologies would be, say, you know, a prior rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever is essentially uh, your immune system mistakenly thinking proteins on the valve are proteins that it had seen uh, previously in, say, uh, another pathogen. And so this sort of immune uh, cross-reaction can cause the immune system to actually attack the valve and it can become sort of scarred and stiffened. And that's actually one of the, the most common causes for mitral stenosis. And as you'll know, the, when it comes to rheumatic fever, uh, that can actually affect any of the valves, but actually the mitral valve is the most common. Endocarditis, uh, so this would be an infection on the valve and we'll have a separate lecture on endocarditis. But if you had, say, a bacterial colony growing on the valve, that can be very damaging to the valve, and it can go one of two ways. It can either damage the valve to cause an insufficiency or regurgitation due to the destruction of the tissue, uh, or it can cause sort of an inflammatory reaction, and that can cause it to stiffen and kind of harden and scar. So it can go one of, one of uh, those two ways. Now, as far as the pathophysiology of a mitral stenosis, what happens is you have recurrent inflammation that leads to scarring. Okay, so this narrows the, the mitral valve orifice or the opening to the mitral valve. And if you narrow that opening, okay, what happens is blood doesn't pass as easily, there's more resistance to that. So the pressures inside the left atrium, okay, which are not used to having a whole lot of pressures to deal with, uh, it can increase because it's holding on to more volume, okay? and it may have to actually start to compensate by increasing the amount of muscle mass that it has there, or in other words, hypertrophy, so that it can actually contract hard enough to eject a uh, you know, significantly more vo a higher volume of blood. So what happens is, uh, as a result of, say, mitral stenosis, you can have left atrial pressures increase. 
okay and that's that's a compensation to increase the amount of volume moving from the left atrium into the left ventricle through a narrow opening okay the problem with this is that the left atrium is connected to the pulmonary veins and the pulmonary veins remember there's four of them okay there are no valves that separate the pulmonary veins from the circulation in the pulmonary um, vasculature so if pressures go up in the left atrium that can translate remember they're in series that can translate backwards into the lung vasculature and it increases the pressure in the lung vasculature and ultimately that can increase the pressure on the right side and so on and so forth okay uh, so <clears throat> If you if say somebody has a certain degree of stenosis uh, anything that's going to you know cause an increase of flow or a needed increase of flow across that valve can uh, exacerbate any underlying disorder that might be there because of the stenosis so for instance I have one of my bullet points uh, anything that increases flow across the valve like exercise or the heart is tachycardic for another reason maybe the person's ill they have a fever uh, this can exacerbate pulmonary hypertension type symptoms and the person could become dyspneic, right? They can become short of breath, um, makes the heart have to work a little bit harder, all right? Um, if, and again, this would depend on the degree of the, the stenosis. If they've had long-standing mitral stenosis, um, this can result in pulmonary hypertension. And if they've had long-standing pulmonary hypertension because of the elevated pressures, that can lead to right ventricular uh, heart failure. Long-standing uh, mitral stenosis can also lead to AFib. And what you're gonna notice, and this is actually sort of underlying most of these disorders that I'm gonna talk about, is that anytime you have sort of a, a stenosis or, or a regurg and you have compensation taking place, what happens is that can cause a compensation to, for example, like the left atrium could start to expand because it's holding on to more volume that it can't eject into the left ventricle as readily. Over time, the ventricle can sort of remodel and the pressures can continue to rise. And if that's the case, what you're doing is you're essentially distorting um, the, the conductive pathways, the normal conductive pathways of the heart. And so you can have arrhythmias form um, and that can be associated with things like palpitations in these cases. Uh, or it, it, one of the more common ones is actually AFib, so atrial fibrillation. Again, we'll talk more about atrial fibrillations and the ins and outs of it um, in terms of its treatments and clinical diagnosis and so on in a different lecture. Now, mitral stenosis is usually asymptomatic until the mitral valve area is so narrow, approximately less than uh, you know one and a half centimeters squared, that uh, once it's that narrow, you you actually have it significantly narrow enough to cause uh, enough volume backage blocking blockage, excuse me, enough volume buildup, excuse me, that it can actually translate back into the uh, lung vasculature and that can cause dyspnea and even uh, pulmonary edema, okay, where fluid starts to actually extravasate outside of the vasculature and into the tissue itself. So some of the clinical features of mitral stenosis, I kind of already mentioned, uh, you could have dyspnea. Now, you could have dyspnea at rest, which means it's pretty severe, uh, orthopnea, Okay, again, remember that's, you know, shortness of breath on reclining and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. So these are kind of signs of what looks like heart failure. Uh, it could also be an indication of something like a, a stenotic valve like mitral stenosis. Uh, it would reduce their exercise capacity because I can't move enough volume into the left ventricle and the left ventricle is responsible for ejecting blood into the systemic circulation. Okay, so my uh, so it would you know, stand to reason that my exercise capacity would go down if it doesn't get the nutrients and oxygen that it needs. Now it could be mild, all right, where the dyspnea is really absent all right, at rest. Uh, you may only have mild dyspnea uh, on exertion uh, or maybe even no dyspnea at all, to be honest. And the, you know, it could be associated with palpitations, again, from you know, changing of the architecture of the, the conducting pathway, pathways. Uh, or even just irritation of the myocardium. And it, it can also be associated with chest pain, okay? Now, as far as the signs of mitral stenosis, all right, it's uh, on auscultation, it can have a murmur. Now, the classic for this is going to be an opening snap. So it's a diastolic, all right, low pitch, excuse me, low pitch. So you're hearing it with the bell of your stethoscope. It's a diastolic decrescendo murmur. So I have that 
right here. So it's a diastolic decrescendo murmur. So this is between S1 and S2 over here. And so here's the opening snap labeled OS. And you can see it's decrescendo. Okay. And then there's a little crescendo there at the at the end when the atria, or the left atrium contracts, it increases pressure and creates a little bit of a crescendo there at the very end of diastole. Okay. Uh, so that's what they mean by the pre systolic accentuation. All right. So this is again low pitch diastolic decrescendo. There's an opening snap that can be heard. Okay. There can be a palpable heave. Um, if it's affecting the right side of the heart, you might feel a little bit of a lift uh, to the left of the sternum. If it's very advanced, okay, you might have signs of right heart failure. We'll have a separate lecture on heart failure, but just to give you an idea, okay, uh, signs of right heart failure, keeping in mind if the right side of the heart is failing, it's not able to move blood effectively into the uh, pulmonary vasculature, it can back up. If it backs up, it backs up into the venous system. All right, the systemic venous system. The systemic, systemic venous system is a low pressure system. So what you can see is distended veins and edema. Okay, so that's sort of the, 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 the signs of right-sided heart failure. And so when I say right-sided heart failure, you see JVD, that's jugular venous distension. So the jugular vein in the neck may start to become very prominent and be distended. In some cases, you can even see these uh, bounding pulses in there. Keeping in mind that the jugular vein, okay, the venous system as it connects, I should say, as it connects to the right atrium, all right, has no valves that go back into the jugular veins there. So if pressures on the right side of the heart start to build up, then the venous system or the jugular veins and stuff have no valves, okay? So it's directly linked to the right atrium. If the pressure goes up in the right atrium, it'll be reflected in those, in those veins. And you can see that, okay? Now when I say hepatomegaly, because there's a lot of large veins that go through the vein, uh, through the, uh, the liver, so in those cases, what's happening is you're, you're causing essentially edema of the liver. So the liver can become enlarged. And if the liver becomes enlarged, it can also impinge blood flow through the liver and that can cause extravasation of fluid into the abdominal cavity, thus causing ascites. Again, this is all because it's all in series. And then ultimately this, this is, you know, can cause peripheral edema as the pressures rise. Uh, very rarely, but it can, it can happen. You can have compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve okay because it is close in proximation to some of these structures here all right uh the pulmonary hypertension okay if pulmonary hypertension is forming because of the increased pressure you can have a loud s2 or specifically a p2 all signs and symptoms uh will increase with exercise um, and pregnancy because pregnancy is a state of high volume and an increase in volume uh, would obviously exacerbate a situation where you're having difficulty moving volume through the heart. Hemoptysis, because you have increased pressures in the lungs, so that can cause rupture of blood vessels. And thromboembolism. Uh, thromboembolism is really more or less associated with the stagnation of blood flow that can occur, as well as the possibility that you, you may form atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation, it's very common when an atrium is fibrillating, it's not moving blood very well causing stagnation and turbulence, which is really putting the patient at risk for a thrombus to form. The diagnosis and treatment uh, for mitral stenosis, uh, what you're gonna see there's a pattern actually. Uh, chest x-rays and echoes are most commonly gonna be used for most of the diagnoses here um, in a workup, including the physical diagnosis, which is, would include the auscultation. So the chest x-ray, uh, you know, you, would, you might see left atrial enlargement on the silhouette um, of a frontal uh, x-ray. Uh, you, you might also see, you know, from the lateral view, you could also see a bulging left atrium. Uh, pulmonary vascular congestion may or may not be present depending on whether or not, um, you know, how severe or chronic this has been. What, in other words, how, if, it, if the, the body has time to adapt, you may not see as much congestion. So if it's more chronic and not as severe, you may not see it. On the other hand, if it is severe um, and they maybe haven't had as much time to adapt with it, you might see more, more congestion. So it depends. On the echo, the echo is really going to be the standard. So this is going to be the most important test you're going to do. Uh, it's going to confirm the diagnosis. All right, because it can visualize it directly. It can see thickened 
micro leaflet, leaflets, excuse me, which would you know suggest the scarring that's taking place. They might see fusion and that the valves are not moving appropriately. It can also quantify and actually measure the the uh, the mitral valve orifice, and so that you can have a better predictor of the severity. Okay, uh, and also the blood flow. So this this gives a good picture, overall picture of, of the severity of it and the prognosis and so on. So that can help dictate treatment. As far as treatment is concerned, we really have medical and surgical approaches. The medical could be diuretic, all right, where you give something, you know, medication to help them offload some of the volume. And in doing so, that can help remove some of the pulmonary congestion if they have it. Uh, also relieve some of the edema. And beta blockers could be used. The idea with the beta blockers, um, it would decrease the heart rate, which would reduce the exacerbation that might be felt. Um, you know, if there's an increase in heart rate at rest, okay, they have tachycardia, uh, that can cause an exacerbation of the, the, steno the stenosis. Uh, in addition, by giving the beta blocker, you're allowing more time for the left ventricle to fill up with the, you know, through a stenotic valve. Surgically, um, you can use a percutaneous balloon mitral valvuloplasty, which is actually what I have, what I'm showing in the cartoon over here. And the most common procedure is actually they take the catheter and they insert it through the right side of the heart, and they actually go through the interatrial septum, and then they insert it between the uh, the leaflets of the mitral valve there, and then they apply some pressure to inflate a balloon. As you can see, the balloon inflates, and it can essentially crack open, if you will the stiffened mitral valve and uh, under certain circumstances that actually can that can actually be very very um, uh, helpful in these situations the open mitral valve commissurotomy is actually just an open surgery where they will you know make incisions to actually open up the leaflets again or depending on how severe it is and if the patient can tolerate it they might go for a complete replacement so it depends this would be a patient to patient basis so overall, in terms of the management of this, uh, no therapy is required if the patient is asymptomatic. Okay, so there's no, no requirement for therapy. Um, the diuretics, if the patient has some mild symptoms and some dyspnea, if it's more severe, the, the gold standard is really surgical. All right. If the patient has AFib, we'll talk about AFib on a separate lecture, but you would have to treat the AFib accordingly, especially since they had an increase for thromboembolism. Okay, so mitral regurgitation, or otherwise known as insufficiency. This is where the blood volume now will be moving backwards. So it's going from the left ventricle into the left atrium. Remember, remember that you know these are they're supposed to be, under normal physiological conditions, one-way valves. They should not be going uh, backwards, right? Uh, so when it comes to insufficiency or regurgitation, again, there, there's a whole gradation of severity. Uh, but one of the ways we classify or one of the ways in which we can uh, predict severity is based on whether it was acute or chronic. Okay, uh, so with insufficiency, we look at acute and chronic. So acute, it means that we have a sudden, okay, rupture and blood is moving backwards quickly. If it's chronic, um, the difference here is that this has gone on for a prolonged or protracted period of time. The reason it matters clinically is that an acute situation is an emergency. The reason it's an emergency is if I suddenly, have, if I have a normal valve and then it suddenly becomes insufficient and blood moves backwards very acutely, what, what this means is that the heart has not had time to adapt to this pressure change, okay? Because it takes time for the heart to actually uh, adapt to these different pressure changes. And if it doesn't have time to do that, what happens is the pressures rise very quickly, okay? And that increase in pressure becomes so sudden, it translates back very quickly. It can send the person into florid heart failure very, very rapidly. So it's an emergency. Whereas in chronic, chronic, it's been going on a long time. Uh, it may have started off fairly mild and it's progressing. Uh, maybe it's progressing, maybe it's not, it depends. But the heart has had time. It's had time to adapt. It's had time to undergo, let's say, hypertrophy or some other type of remodeling to help compensate and offset um, any of the pressures that may have been, uh, any of the changes that may have occurred. So that's the, the major difference with these, you know, whether it's acute versus chronic. So moving on, for regurgitation, the left ventricular stroke volume, 
okay, is ejected, some of it's going to be ejected backwards into the left atrium. So that's what the regurgitation means, okay? The amount uh, regurgitated backwards really depends on multiple factors, okay? Uh, basically, you know, how open, you know, how much of the orifice is open to allow the blood to flow backwards, if it's small versus large, okay? Uh, how compliant is the left atrium? Okay, if it's very compliant, it can take those that volume backwards and the pressure doesn't go up a whole lot. Okay, because it will dilate along with the volume and, and that helps to prevent pressures from rising too quickly. Uh, also, what's the, the person's afterload? In other words, are they hypertensive? You know, um, if they are, it's harder to eject blood out of the left ventricle and into the aorta, which is what it's supposed to do, if there's a lot of resistance. What happens is it's going to take the path of least resistance and eject more of it back into the left atrium. So there's multiple things that, that can come into play in terms of the severity of the regurgitation, okay, uh, or the volume of the regurgitation, I should say. So uh, if we do have an elevation of the left atrial um, volume and pressure, it's going to have the same impact that the mitral stenosis did, essentially. If left atrial pr pressures do rise, that's going to translate backwards into the pulmonary circulation to the right side of the heart, as I, was, as I discussed with the mitral stenosis. Uh, ultimately, the effect here, though, is that the left ventricle has a, a reduced cardiac or can have a, a reduced cardiac output. So that's what I have listed here. Let me write that here. So here's reduced cardiac output. So in severe cases, you can see a drop in the cardiac output. Okay. So we have volume-related stress on the left ventricle, and the reason is this. So imagine the left ventricle is trying to eject blood into the aorta. Some of it's going back instead to the left atrium. The left atrium receives the same normal amount of volume it would under normal conditions, plus it's receiving the volume that's being ejected backwards. So that's volume overload in the left atrium. Now all that volume is returning back to the left ventricle. Okay, So left ventricle is seeing an increase in its overall volume with every beat because it's getting not only the, the blood that it couldn't eject into the aorta, but it's also receiving the normal amount that it would from the uh, left atrium. So it's getting a combination of those two, so it becomes volume overloaded. Now, I, I put in parentheses here, eccentric hypertrophy. So in response, chronic in chronic conditions, in response to this volume overload in the left ventricle, what's gonna happen is that at least I should say at least immediately what's going to happen is that volume overload is going to extend the fibers, the myocytes, via the Starling mechanism, it's going to contract harder and eject and help to maintain that cardiac output. So that's without any modifications, without any hypertrophy, simply the Starling mechanism with that increased volume will help us to inject the cardiac, uh, increase that cardiac output and help maintain homeostasis. However, if this is chronic and then we're chronically overloading that left ventricle with this volume, what's going to happen is the left ventricle is going to undergo hypertrophy, specifically what we call an eccentric hypertrophy. I'm going to get into more detail on these types of hypertrophy in a separate lecture, but in short, what happens is a volume overloaded chamber undergoes eccentric hypertrophy, so the chamber itself becomes bigger, okay, so we, to hold on to more volume, okay. Now, in the acute mitral regurg, left atrial compliance. This is the acute uh, scenario. Heart has not had a chance to adapt, so there's no chance for the left atrium, which is not as compliant, okay, hasn't had time to change. All right, pressures will increase very rapidly in the left atrium. So we get a jet of blood going back into the left atrium. It's had no chance to adapt, so pressures go up very quickly. That translates back into the pulmonary circulation. It can cause congestion very rapidly. The person could suffocate. Okay, that could also cause extreme duress to the right side of the heart. The person going to right side of heart failure. So it's an emergency. In chronic, however, the, the it's had time. So left atrium's had time to adapt uh, to become more compliant to help offset the pressure increase. Okay, this helps to lessen the effects of the regurgitation, which helps to lessen the effects on pulmonary on the pulmonary circulation and all and you know onto the right side of the heart as well. Um, you can get left atrial and left ventricular dilatation. Okay, so that's part of the compensation. That's the hypertrophy that I was, I was speaking about, the eccentric hypertrophy, for example. And so that hypertrophy helps to offset uh, a drop in cardiac output. Okay, and uh, you know, in, in 
the these changes, however, as I mentioned from the uh, mitral stenosis, can cause uh, you know just physical or anatomical changes uh, that can alter conduction pathways and can lead to things like uh, arrhythmias and AFib is again another common one to find in you know a dilated left atrium. In terms of the clinical features, uh, some of the symptoms would be very characteristic of what we saw with stenosis, where there is shortness of breath. Um, it could be on exertion or even at rest, depending on the, the severity of it. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or thopnea, very, very similar. Fatigue and weakness would obviously be a part of that, it would also be a part of mitral stenosis as well. Uh, palpitations based on the arrhythmias. And the signs for it, you could have a holosystolic murmur. So a holosystolic murmur, remember there's crescendo and decrescendo, so it goes up and then down. Holosystolic is the same throughout, it makes a whooshing sound. And uh, it's best heard at the apex, because remember the apex is uh, where we best hear the mitral valve. And so that's in the mid-clavicular line at the fifth intercostal space. Radiation of that sound uh, can go to the back, to the left axilla, or to around the clavicular region. And with, as far as the maneuvers are concerned, you can actually intensify the sound of this by having the patient do that hand grip, which is what I mentioned in the, the heart sounds like just like you grip their hand, it increases afterload. If I increase the afterload, that means more of the blood that when the left ventricle contracts is going to be shunted towards the lower pressure left atrium. Okay, AFib again is, is common and we will talk about treatments later. There can be what we call an S3 gallop. So in the heart sounds, we talked about an S3 sound, which occurs during diastole. And what this is, is basically blood come, uh, filling into uh, a very large chamber, almost like a sloshing sound when it hits the wall, okay? And this, this can cause what we call an S3 gallop, and it occurs early on in diastole, okay? And that would be because of the eccentric hypertrophy. In addition, it can cause the, the left ventricle to become large. And so it can displace the point of maximal impulse or the PMI. So when you palpate for that, it would be displaced more laterally because now the, the left ventricle is enlarged. Recall that the PMI uh, under normal physiological conditions is actually uh, palpated the midclavicular line and um, that it's indicative of the, the position of the left ventricle, okay, how far over it is. Now, if you look at the chest x-ray that I have up here for you guys, uh, understand the x-ray can look different depending on the situation. So if I have a uh, patient who is um, having an acute episode, the lungs could look very edematous and it could look um, very white because the fluid that's filling it up would fill in airways too and make it look more opaque and less black, more white and less black. If it's more chronic, like it might be in this patient that we see here, uh, unfortunately, my video, I think, may be covering this a little bit, but the uh, you can see the edge of it here. So that's the left atrium is somewhat enlarged, which can be seen in, in a chronic conditions. And then the left ventricle uh, would also be uh, larger. So the heart silhouette might look larger. And if you look at the heart it, or the lungs, it, it could also be congested as well. And if you look closely, I want to circle a few areas around here so you guys can see. Those areas, if you look, it looks like kind of like little white rings there. Uh, so it's called peribronchiolar cuffing. And that's a, a sign of congestion of the walls of the airways there. It creates little white rings like that. So this person does have some, some congestion as well. So that was actually a diagnostic tool. So I kind of put that on the, the wrong slide there. But here, diagnosis that was the chest x-ray that I just went over. Okay. Uh, again, in an acute case, if they haven't had you know, regurgitation for a long period of time, their heart may not look enlarged at all, okay? But their lungs would be very congested as the pressures build up in the lungs rapidly. Echo, again, is gonna be sort of our standard to identify structural causes of the mitral regurg. And so uh, we can evaluate, again, the, the, the movements. We can measure the, the, the orifice and the opening there. Uh, we can track patients serially, so we can see that, you know, if, if we hear on an exam the person's asymptomatic, we can just follow them over, say, you know, we get them checked every six months or a year, depending on, you know, how we feel that uh, the mitral regurg is progressing. 
or the severity of it. And so we can kind of keep an eye on that. Another thing to kind of keep in mind when, when you're doing these exams is that uh, when we do an echo, we'll also be examining things like the uh, left ventricular wall and, the, and measuring thickness there. And we'll take multiple measurements uh, because you know, the, the cause of regurgitation may not be because the valve itself is defective. Okay, It may actually be because there might be hypertrophy of the left ventricular wall causing so much expansion that it's pulling the leaflets apart. Okay, So actually another designation we could call with regurg is primary and secondary. Primary just means that the valve is directly involved or the components of the valve like the chordae tendinae and the, uh, the leaflets, um, the annulus. Uh, the annulus is the ring, the connective tissue ring that holds on to the leaflets. So those would be part of like the primary, okay? Versus secondary means there's something else going on in the heart that's not involving the valve, but it's causing the valve to become distorted. In terms of treatment, we have our, again, medical and surgical. Medical, we, we can do after load reduction, you know, like an antihypertensive. Um, so, you know, we cause, you know, vasodilation. And we would use this for symptomatic patients only, okay? And, you know, if they're, not, if they're asymptomatic, uh, we'll usually just follow them with an echo and you know, track any kind of progression. But we don't want to give a vasodilator to somebody who's asymptomatic because it can mask uh, the progression of the disease. We want to anticoagulate them if they're an AFib. Um, IABP stands for intra-aortic balloon pump. Now, I don't have a diagram of it here, but I will be discussing it in other lectures in more depth. But uh, in short, what this is, is you insert a catheter in through the arteries and up through the aorta. And the tip of the uh, catheter, or segment of the catheter, actually opens and inflates a, a balloon. And it produces what we call a counter pulsation. In other words, every time the heart contracts or the ventricle contracts to so eject blood into the aorta, the balloon deflates. And that creates a vacuum and helps to draw blood out of the ventricle as it's contracting. So it helps improve cardiac output. Now, when the heart relaxes, the balloon inflates, it balloons out again. And what that does is that it increases pressure and it forces blood more distally into the periphery as well as back towards the heart and into the coronary arteries to help improve perfusion there. Okay, a lot of times we, you know, this could be used as a bridge uh, to, to surgery, okay, in cases where you have an acute mitral regurg. Surgical, uh, in terms of the surgical procedures, you have mitral valve repair, so you can repair it directly, um, you can replace the valve. You do want to perform uh, before any left ventricular function is too compromised. So when you're doing your evaluation with the echocardiogram, you're going to want to evaluate for left ventricular function, taking a look at you know how what the ejection fraction is, for example, okay, how dilated is it, how thick is the wall, and so on. You want to make sure that you get in there before there's too much because you don't want the left ventricular to be too too much too compromised because replacing the valve may have little benefit at that point. Uh, if the person's you know if they have high risk for surgery and they have severe symptoms and they have favorable anatomy, you could do a transcatheter mitral valve repair, which has been uh, fairly successful, okay, and a good option for those who are high risk for, for surgery. Okay, so uh, the last one on the mitral valve is mitral valve prolapse. Mitral valve prolapse, uh, this is abnormal billowing of the an excessive portion of one or both mitral valve leaflets into the left atrium. Uh, during systole. So basically it's, it's ballooning into the uh, left atrium excessively and it's often associated with some regurgitation. Uh, so that's why I put you know a company with MR. The etiology of it is typically there's a connective tissue issue, uh, autosomal dominant with variable penetrance, uh, Marfan's and uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome which are connective tissue disorders uh, have higher um, higher risk for this. It's mo most commonly we found that it's it's found in you know thin or lean women women more than men and you know it's a loose arrangement of connective tissue that billows backwards the the prolapse the clinical features of it it's usually asymptomatic uh, but you know the, the patients can complain of some chest pain or palpitations um, and it has been associated with you know some some arrhythmias now in terms of uh, auscultation classically there is a mid systolic click and a, a murmur so a mid systolic click and a murmur 
best heard at the apex again because it's the mitral valve. Now, in terms of maneuvers, the murmur is delayed, okay? The sound of the click and the murmur is delayed by increasing left ventricular volume. So, for example, from the heart sound lecture, I mentioned that if we exhale, we increase volume to the left side of the heart. By increasing the volume there, you can delay the murmur. So if you hear it and you think you're hearing a mitral valve uh, murmur, uh, what I should say, if you think you're hearing a mitral valve prolapse murmur, you can do a maneuver like exhale and continue to listen or squatting. Squatting can also do that. Okay. Now on echo, uh, echo will give us visual confirmation of it. And you can see the echo actually I have over here. You can see the red line. So this is the left atrium left ventricle so that means that's the valve where the red line the dash is through there and that red line is actually an indicator of sort of the plane with which we measure the the bulge of this valve and this is actually an outline of the valve right here and you can see it's bulging back into the left atrium and so we would measure that okay now the ekg and the chest x-ray are typically normal in terms of the treatment for this most of them are going to be asymptomatic, and it's usually just a matter of reassurance, okay? But very rarely, uh, you know, you, it may require surgery, but it's, it's, it's a benign condition for the most part. If they have chest pain, uh, beta blockers have helped with that. Helps also reduce some of the anxiety as well as uh, some of the chest pain, but it's not typically required. Okay, so now we're moving on to the aortic valve. Aortic valve stenosis, we have a stenotic valve. Okay, most commonly this is sort of a degenerative calcification of the normal valve, uh, which can be found in, in you know, elderly patients. And, uh, or they could have calcification of a congenitally bicuspid valve, remembering that the lunar, uh, lunar valves have three cusps. So this would be a bicuspid valve. A bicuspid valve puts them at a higher risk for calcification. Okay, and in fact, the calcifications that are occurring on the aortic valve are, um, are similar to the process of atherosclerosis, which I'll discuss in more depth in another lecture, but basically it follows a very similar pattern. And um, so we'll keep that in mind. And then there's you know rheumatic fever, which I mentioned with mitral stenosis, for example, can cause it to be stenotic. The risk factors, dyslipidemia, smoking, and hypertension, which are all risk factors for atherosclerosis, because since this process of calcification of the aorta is, follows a process similar to atherosclerosis, it also carries with it the same risk factors, okay? Uh, obstruction to outflow, right? So what's happening is you have a stenotic, uh, you know, aortic valve, which means that the left ventricle has to increase the amount of pressures that it's, it's producing in order to eject an appropriate stroke volume or eject a normal cardiac output, okay? Now, what's happening here is since the left ventricle has to, is under a high pressure system, meaning it has to generate a lot of pressure to eject the volume, it's not necessarily volume overloaded, but it has to generate a lot of pressure. This can initially produce a concentric hypertrophy. This is different from eccentric. Eccentric is a very large chamber. This it would be a smaller chamber because the uh, ventricular wall thick, uh, thickens disproportionately. And it thickens almost inward, so it creates a smaller chamber, and it's a very thick muscle. So you end up with left, uh, elevated left ventricular diastolic pressures because it's less compliant, okay? Uh, and it becomes more of a, a stiffer, uh, thicker ventricle. And so the diastolic pressures will increase. Uh, that increases left atrial pressure because the atria has to be able to eject that blood into that higher pressure left ventricle. And so the left atrium in response to that would hypertrophy. And so you get progressive remodeling and it can lead to what we call diastolic dysfunction where it's not relaxing very well. And we'll talk about diastolic dysfunction in the heart failure lecture in more depth. This can cause three characteristic problems when it comes to aortic stenosis. These three characteristic problems. First off is angina. Angina is chest pain due to ischemia. With angina, you have a heart that is hypertrophied and thickened, and it's a lot more muscle mass, requires more oxygen and more blood flow, okay? 
you're already having difficulty getting some cardiac output out. And so the lack of cardiac output and the increase in, in demand due to all that muscle can cause angina. This is particularly uh, an issue with a smaller aortic valve, less than, say, one centimeter squared. Exertional syncope, meaning they're passing out when they exert themselves or losing consciousness. The reason for that is they're not, they don't have a cardiac output that can match the, uh, the appropriate flow for exertion. So in response to uh, that lack of cardiac output, peripherally they'll vasodilate to increase their flow. That vasodilation drops their blood pressure and they, they have a syncopal episode. Heart failure can ensue from the increasing hypertrophy and you know, the lack of, of blood supply ultimately. In terms of the clinical features, again, angina, angina, syncope, and heart failure are all sort of characteristic uh, symptoms. So the heart failure symptoms would be shortness of breath on exertion, orthopnea, and so on. The signs, uh, if you auscultate, you'd hear a high-pitched crescendo, de decrescendo. So it crescendoing as it's trying to force blood through a narrow opening, and it decrescendos as it starts to relax. Um, and so this is a systolic ejection murmur. And what happens is since it's having trouble moving blood into the, into the arteries, the pulses, the arterial pulses would become weaker. We're not getting as much of a bulge or deflection due to the volume. It's a lot lesser volume, so I get less of a, uh, a pulse ultimately. So you get what we call weak carotid pulses. And um, you can also get radiation of that sound into the carotid specifically. The S4 can be heard because in an S4, S4 is in late diastole, and it's reflective of the atria contracting at the end of diastole into a very stiff ventricle. So we hear an S4. Again, that's a galloping sound. In terms of the pulses, again, they would be uh, late and they would be diminished. They're late because it takes time to get that blood out through that constricted um, aortic valve, and they're diminished because it's not getting as much volume out. Okay. Uh, in addition, you could also feel a thrill. In fact, they can, depending on the degree of the stenosis, it can create a vibration that can be palpable. Uh, in terms of diagnosis and treatment, uh, again, chest x-ray and echo. The chest x-ray, you could actually see uh, uh, the calcifications because they would show up white like bone. Um, and you could visualize an enlarged left ventricle and left atrium on the silhouette. The echo, echoes are standard tests. You can, again, measure left ventricular wall thickness. You could actually see the smaller chamber, the thick wall. Uh, you can measure the, the orifice again and check for the gradients and pressures and so on. You can stress test patients with this as long as they're asymptomatic. Okay, If they have severe aortic stenosis and they're asymptomatic, you can do that. On the other hand, if they're symptomatic with severe aortic stenosis, do not. Okay, It's contraindicated. Catheterization, uh, you can do a, a cath if um, if the echo is non-diagnostic okay or if it's before surgery if you want to measure coronary blood flow in case they have uh, you know calcifications or strictures in their, their coronary blood vessels in terms of treatment if they're asymptomatic there is no treatment okay you can just monitor it uh, because there's low probability that it progresses to severe if uh, you know, on the other hand, the effective treatment is ultimately aortic valve replacement or AVR. Aortic valve re uh, replacement for severe aortic stenosis with symptoms. Again, if they're asymptomatic, there is no treatment. So with symptoms or if they have left ventricular dysfunction without symptoms. Again, the reason for that is you don't want to see the left ventricular go into uh, a point of failure. So even if they're asymptomatic, if, if your workup on the echo, for example, is suggesting that the left ventricle um, is, you know, very affected by this. Then you might, you would want to consider um, replacement. You can do transcatheter aortic valve replacement, otherwise known as a TAVR or TAVR. Um, and again, depending on severity cases and whether or not the patient meets the criteria for that. Uh, so if they are high risk surgical patients, you might opt for a transcatheter procedure. Okay, we don't typically do valvuloplasties like we did in mitral stenosis, where we use a balloon to open it up, because the restenosis rate is very, very high. And so you can see over here, all right, this is actually a transcatheter valve replacement or a TAVR, where you see the catheter is inserted into the aorta there, 
and then in between all right just put in between the the valve leaflets there and then propped open and left okay aortic regurgitation so now we have blood flow going back from the aorta back into the left ventricle now this is common with a bicuspid valve okay bicuspid valves can also cause stenosis so you saw that on the uh, the previous case infective endocarditis endocarditis is a problem because the infection of the valves can cause either regurgitation or stenosis rheumatic heart disease same problem uh, uh, aortic uh, root disease so in other words if there's a disease of the aorta okay the ascending portion of the aorta if it's if it dilates or there's a dissection of something of some sort uh, that can actually cause the the valve itself to to widen so as i mentioned with mitral regurg you can have primary and secondary basically meaning that the primary means the valve itself is the problem okay like you have an infection on the valve and the valve leaflets are now deteriorating uh, or you can have a secondary meaning that uh, the aortic root is dilating and pulling the leaflets apart so it's not directly associated with the components of the valve Regurg, uh, again, we, we refer to acute versus chronic, all right? So with stenosis, we don't see acute stenosis, okay? But with regurg, we can see acute regurg. If it's acute, it's an emergency. If it's chronic, the, the heart has had time to adapt, so it's, it's less of an emergency, okay? Um, or it progresses more slowly, I should say. There can be emergencies, obviously, with chronic. Now, with the, you know, with the blood returning uh, from the aorta back to the left ventricle, which is the, the insufficiency, uh, volume can increase in the left ventricle. Uh, this can cause volume overload, okay, uh, in the left ventricle, which can back up and, of course, affect the left atrium and then the lungs and so on. And uh, what happens is, at least initially, is the volume goes back from the aorta into the a left ventricle that can cause the Frank Starling mechanism to kick in and help to increase your cardiac output. Okay, so that's the problem is the cardiac output would suffer because as you eject the blood, it's coming back into the left ventricle, which it should not be, right? So, um, by having a larger volume in the left ventricle without any um, remodeling taking place, the, the Starling mechanism would cause the ejection to be larger to help offset that. But if it's chronic, then we get remodeling. Now, in terms of acute, the left ventricle is not that compliant yet. It hasn't had a chance to hypertrophy at all. Uh, and so what happens is the pressures transmit backwards very quickly and can cause pulmonary edema rapidly. If it's chronic, all right, now it's had a chance to actually dilate. Um, that helps become more compliant as well, reduces back pressures. Um, you know, you can have uh, high systolic and low diastolic pressures. So this would be what we call a wide pulse pressure. So you might see a wide pulse pressure in patients who have had chronic aortic regurg. Keeping in mind that, you know, when we talk about pulse pressures, the difference between the systolic and the diastolic. So if my systolic, let's say my blood pressure is 120 over 80, it's the difference. So in this case, the pulse pressure would be 40 millimeters of mercury. All right, 40 millimeters of mercury would be the pulse pressure normally a widened pulse pressure would be greater than 40, for instance, okay? The reason is, uh, as it ejects the blood, the blood drops right back into the left ventricle, the diastolic pressure starts to drop with that, okay? It collapses more rapidly and to a greater degree. So the, the rate with which it, it goes, it recoils is much greater. So you can get a, a widened pulse pressure. Now, this can progress to ultimately what we call systolic dysfunction, which is different from the diastolic dysfunction I just discussed with aortic stenosis, um, where the ventricle doesn't relax real well because it's pressure overloaded, it has to generate a lot of force. Here it's volume overloaded, and when it becomes volume overloaded, the chamber gets larger, and uh, its, its ability to contract effectively goes down over time. So some of the clinical features of this, uh, shortness of breath again, fatigue, you know, you might get the sensation of a very forceful heartbeat, like it's beating really hard. Um, high pulse pressure, something called a, a quinky's pulse. And what that is, is if you look at the fingernails, you can actually see as it ejects the blood, you see redness in the, the, the bed, bed of the nail there, as it fills up with blood as it's ejecting. And then it rapidly becomes pale as that blood is 
flowing backwards back into the heart. And so it looks like it's sort of flushing and then pale. And then it becomes flushed, like red and then pale. Um, cyanosis and shock uh, can occur depending on the extent of it because you're not able to get enough cardiac output out to the body. Um, and that can typically happen more in an acute situation. Uh, again, because there's no chance for you know adaptation. In terms of the signs, you have a bounding pulses. Okay, what we call a Corrigan pulse or a water hammer pulse. The reason is because you're, you know, we're over volume overloading the left ventricle, so it's when it contracts, it's ejecting large volumes into the, um, into the, you know, arterial system. So the pulses are very large when you feel them, but they drop so suddenly because it's it's a lot of it's flowing back into the left ventricle, so it drops quickly. So it feels like a very bound, a very uh, like a bounding pulse. Uh, widened pulse pressure, as I mentioned. And, you know, decrescendo diastolic murmur is what you'd hear. So it's best heard on the uh, sort of the left sternal border, actually, can be very diagnostic. You can also hear it in the aortic area as well. And uh, it's decrescendo because the blood is it's rushing back into the ventricle. Uh, when it rushes back in there at first, you know, you can hear it fairly prominently. And then that sort of diminishes and becomes more of a decrescendo as it fills up. And uh, you can also hear an S3 because it's a large chamber early in diastole and uh, it's in terms of maneuver you can if you have somebody do the hand grip maneuver you can increase the murmur because by increasing the after load that was that would force more blood back into the left ventricle in terms of diagnosis and treatment uh, chest x-ray echo again you can see an enlarged left ventricle Okay, um, again, that would be absent in the acute scenario, possibly, because they haven't had a chance to adapt. Uh, you might see an enlarged aorta because of the large volumes that have been going in there and causing uh, remodeling of the aorta as well. Uh, the echo, echoes you can perform serially. So if you see there's mild regurgitation, you might you know, perform it and keep an eye on it, especially if the patient's stable and asymptomatic and so on. Uh, you can use the, to, the Doppler to quantify the degree of the aortic regurg, like you could do that with mitral regurg or any of the, the valves. Uh, you can also uh, image to look for any kind of aortic root dilatation to see what the underlying cause may be as well, or see if there's you know, endocarditis or anything else of that nature. In terms of the catheterization, uh, you would use contrast angio for further quantification of the degree of the aortic regurg. Um, and you know assessment of coronary uh, disease not always not always necessary, uh, but might become necessary if the person has chest pain and anginal equivalents, meaning that they're feeling you know um, heart attack type symptoms. The reason being is that if the aortic regurg is severe enough, um, and particularly in acute patients, if the blood's if a lot of that blood that's flowing back into the left ventricle and the valves are not closing at all. Well, the valves help to, when they shut under normal conditions, help to redirect blood that would be that would otherwise go into the left ventricle. It would help to redirect them into the coronary vessels. But if the valve stays open, the blood can go directly back to the left ventricle. You're actually not supplying as much to the coronary blood flow during diastole, and so um, so the heart can actually suffer for that. In terms of treatment, again, if they're asymptomatic and the left ventricle looks normal, there's no treatment. Uh, just you, you know, follow up. Asymptomatic uh, with severe aortic regurg, uh, you could do vasodilators like ACE inhibitors to reduce the after load so that more of the blood can leave the ventricle and hopefully move more peripherally. Uh, if it's you know, if they have impaired left ventricular dysfunction um, and or they have symptom or they're symptomatic, then it's it's going to be a surgical correction. Um, if they're symptomatic, you know, you can use some diuretics and salt restrictions, especially, you know, to help offset some of the volume overload on the heart. That helps, and, and you know, reduce the afterload with an ACE inhibitor. And basically, you could use heart failure type treatments, which, would, which I'll get more into in depth in the heart failure lecture. Acute aortic regurgitation, uh, that's a medical, medical emergency, and that would require uh, replacement in most conditions. Okay, so now we're moving on to the right side of the heart, tricuspid uh, stenosis. So with tricuspid stenosis, again, this is the valve that separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. This, this is more rare, um, but one of the more common causes would be something like rheumatic fever, 
you do see it with cases like endocarditis, um, particularly if you know a patient's history suggests something like IV drug abuse, for example. And so again, this will be a rigid, uh, scarred um, valve. And for this, it, it basically mirrors what you see on the left side of the heart. So I spent a lot of time talking about uh, mitral and aortic because first off, they're more common, uh, but also because you know, they, they also reflect what you're going to see on the right side as well. So opening snap, um, diastolic murmur, similar to, uh, to mitral stenosis. In this case, though, it would intensify on inspiration because you're increasing volume to the right side of the heart. Keep in mind, as I mentioned in the heart sound lecture, that um, for most murmurs, not all, but most, increasing volume increases the sound or the intensity of the murmur. So inspiration increases volume to the right side of the heart and decreases it to the left. Expiration does the, the reverse of that. So we're, by increasing volume, we can increase the intensity of that murmur. The right atrium uh, is directly connected to the superior and inferior vena cava. There is no valves uh, separating the right atrium from uh, accessing the, the venous system, as I mentioned earlier. So if you have an increase in pressure in the right atrium, so it's not able to get that blood into the right ventricle and pressure starts to rise, that can translate back into the systemic venous system. So that's when we refer to things like waves. And these are basically waves that you would see or pulsations that you would see in the venous system based on what's going on with the heart, since essentially the venous system is in open communication with the right atrium. Okay. So. For example, what you're seeing over here in the jugular venous pulse, you see this upward wave here up to point A. That increase in pressure, that peak that you see at A, is actually the right atrium during contraction. So when it contracts, it generates more pressure. The pressure goes up, and that causes an increase in pressure in the, vena, in the jugular veins, and that's normal. And then as it relaxes, you notice that there's a descent here, a decrease in the, in the, uh, the pulse. But then there's a little blip here where we have C. C really uh, is just a reflection of the fact that the right ventricle is contracting and the uh, tricuspid valve is bulging, suddenly bulging into the right atrium a little bit. And that's normal. And that can cause a little blip in pressure in, uh, in the jugular veins, okay? Because it's caused a little bit of increased pressure in the right atrium. Then it descends and what we have last is this other peak here. So we have the two peaks really, A and V. The V peak is actually just uh, an increase in pressure in the right atrium, secondary to passive filling. As the veins fill it up with blood, the pressure starts to increase. And so that's what you're seeing is the V wave really reflects just passive filling of the right atrium. Um, you know, so it's passively filling with blood as the right ventricle is going through its systolic phase. And so you see that repeated with A here and V here. So contraction of the atria and then filling up passively there with V. So when I say the neck veins distend with large A waves, what that means is if I have a stenotic valve and I can't get blood through and it contracts against a rigid valve, that's going to generate pressure, higher pressures that reflect backwards. And so the A wave would be larger. Okay, you'd see a larger A wave, larger uh, pulses in the veins there. Okay. It could develop hepatomegaly because the backed up pressures causes the congestion of the uh, of the liver since a lot of the large blood vessels travel through the liver on route to the to the heart and abdominal distension or ascites okay treatment is typically a, a percutaneous balloon dilatation right so uh, you know valvuloplasty go in there and break it open uh, in some cases it could be valve replacement in terms of regurgitation um, Again, right ventricle is going to be ejecting some of the blood backwards into the right atrium instead of into the pulmonary circulation. So what's going to happen is you can end up with a you know, right ventricular enlargement. Okay. Now keep in mind with the right side of the heart, the right side of the heart is not used to high pressures because it just ejects into the pulmonary circulation, which is a low pressure system. So it doesn't adapt very well to sudden onsets of high pressures. However, it does adapt to you know, volumes fairly well, so larger volumes. So we get an increase in this case of right ventricular volume because some of the volume is not going to the pulmonary circulation, it's going back into the right atrium. Right atrium is filling up with its normal amount of blood plus what got ejected backwards, and that comes back into the right ventricle. Thus, the right ventricle becomes volume overloaded. All right, 
Um, again, what can cause this, things like rheumatic disease, endocarditis, and so on. Uh, I said I mentioned IV drug abuse on the previous one, so that can that can happen either way. We can get regurgitation or stenosis. In this case, um, we would get a prominent V wave. So just as I discussed with the waves, we have the A wave, which happens during contraction, and the V wave, which is a peak during passive filling of the atria. Now imagine when it's passively filling, the tricuspid valve should be closed. Okay. However, if there's regurgitation, that means that the pressure that's being generated in the right ventricle is pushing fluid back into the right atrium, causing an increase in pressure during that time. So the V wave, which normally has this a certain peak when it passively fills is going to be higher than normal because it's also receiving increased volume and pressure from the vent right ventricle which it's openly communicating with and you can also get a pulsatile lever because as the right ventricle contracts that's basically an open communication to the right atrium also the venous system which can cause the veins inside the liver itself to actually pulse which is by the way why we also examine the abdomen uh, during a cardiac examination this can cause peripheral edema. Uh, in terms of auscultation, a holosystolic murmur, all right, uh, increases with inspiration. The echo can quantify the degree of the tricuspid regurg and so on. Uh, treatment is basically directed at the underlying cause. Okay, if it's endocarditis and so on, I have a separate lecture for that. Diuretics for the congestion, uh, surgical replacement if it's severe. Pulmonic stenosis. Um, so for Pulmonic stenosis, this is rare, uh, and this is more typically congenital than anything else. And uh, this usually presents with fatigue and dyspnea because of the lack, uh, the lack of blood flow going into the pulmonary circulation to be oxygenated, uh, which ultimately reflects in a, a lower output by the left side of the heart. Uh, it does have, in terms of auscultation, the same uh, presentation. Uh, it has a crescendo, decrescendo murmur, but it usually would, it can radi radiate to the neck uh, or even the left shoulder. You could differentiate, you know, aortic stenosis from pulmonic stenosis based on, on maneuvers again. So for example, uh, inhaling or exhaling and, uh, to increase or decrease blood flow. You could do a, a grip test and that might diminish the aortic stenosis, but it wouldn't have any effect on the pulmonic stenosis. So you do a maneuver that maybe help you figure that out. Um, it could present with a right ventricular uh, hypertrophy. And so this would, again, since it's a stenotic valve, it's causing a lot of pressure overload on the right ventricle. The, it would cause you know, that concentric hypertrophy of the right ventricle. And since the right ventricle is the most anterior uh, in the chest cavity there, it could cause a heave. So you could actually feel a parasternal lift on palpation. A transcatheter balloon valvuloplasty is um, usually the, the treatment of choice. Uh, this doesn't work well in the aortic stenosis, but pulmonic stenosis is more successful. In terms of pulmonary uh, regurgitation, uh, develops in the uh, setting of severe pulmonary hypertension most typically. So what happens is uh, that could be secondary to a problem with the left side of the heart. So if you had mitral stenosis, for example, and pressures increase in the left atrium, which then subsequently increase pressures in the pulmonary vasculature, that could affect the right side of the heart and one of the effects it can cause is uh, pulmonic insufficiency or regurgitation. Uh, but as we'll discuss in another lecture, pulmonary hypertension has other root causes and by increasing pressures and overload there that can actually cause uh, the valve to become insufficient or even stretch the valve out. On exam it's a decrescendo diastolic murmur similar to the aortic regurgitation. Uh, so again, it's going to be a matter of listening to the appropriate places. Dynamic auscultation is going to help, um, so doing those maneuvers. So to differentiate aortic regurge from pulmonic regurge, inspiration is going to increase the pulmonic regurge and it reduces the aortic regurge, for example. Ultimately, the echo is going to differentiate uh, the two for you anyway, but it's, it's good to know it on a physical exam. Okay. Now, lastly, um, in terms of the uh, prosthesis that can be used for replacements. Uh, just This is just a brief kind of just touch on the subject um, just to understand some basic points is that if, if the valve is going to be replaced, you, you know, we call that a prosthetic heart valve and, uh, you know, we might use either a mechanical or a biologic. Now, in terms of the advantages, 
you know, of a mechanical, for example, mechanicals have very long shelf life. You know, they can last for more than 20 years, which is which is great. Uh, however, uh, it would require lifelong anticoagulation because uh, it's not covered in a protective endothelium that helps prevent coagulation. So anticoagulation for a lifetime, which has its own associated risks of bleeding and so on. Uh, you know, it can produce a, a click on occultation, so you hear a click because of the uh, just the mechanics of the material. In terms of the biologic, um, it doesn't last as long. You know, the biologics, this could be, you know, a, a pig valve, a cow valve, or, you know, a cadaver valve, for example. They last not as long, about 8 to 10 years on average. They don't require any anticoagulation because they do have a surface that is, you know, less, um, less prone to coagulation, and they don't produce a click. Now, in terms of... Um, you know, choosing one versus another, really that's a matter of maybe patient's expected lifespan, you know, uh, versus, you know, the benefits of anticoagulation in the patient and the risk to them, and also the surgical preference uh, or the surgeon's preference. But keep in mind, and I'll discuss this again in, in another lecture with the endocarditis, uh, it does put them at an increased risk for endocarditis, and so it's something that has to be um, assessed uh, for certain uh, procedures. Lastly, what I want you guys to do is just take a look at this question. All right, it's a sort of a, a basic question, but I want you guys to take a look at it um, and see if you can figure out which is which, uh, which you know, what, what the answer is, and we'll discuss it uh, during our session live. Okay, take care.